Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Eptig of HR Harmer in New York City. I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Now, Michael, this is a really exciting one. This yeah. is um, this is a big one. This is uh, one of the most visible, uh, significant uh, people in the hobby worldwide, I would say. This is, um, you know, somebody who, who really is um, uh, an exceptional um, uh, steward for the hobby, a promoter of the hobby, a mm-hmm. benefactor of the hobby, a great philatelist himself. Yeah. Um, Patrick Misalis is the president of the Club de Monte Carlo, former president of the Royal Philatelic Society of London, the first non-British president that that club has ever had. Wow. Um, wow. He is, uh, Patrick is just phenomenal. He's, he, again, a great collector, great person, great speaker. Whenever I see him at a, you know, give a keynote address at a show or something, um, just really uh, an exciting person to be able to speak to right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and after Alex, the person that I'd credit the most with us actually meeting each other, because the, and, and, and it was through Alex's and Patrick's, yeah. um, uh, you know, Connection. joint efforts. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Alex is a member of the Club de Monte Carlo. Patrick is the president of the club, and uh, you know they they had hatched this. We'll let Patrick talk more about it, but right. um, basically, it was through Alex and Patrick working together that we have both been able to. Uh, attend Monaco Phil, which is a, a show held every two years um, in Monte Carlo, which forgetting the philatelic aspects of it is just one of the most exciting right. trips that one can take, I think, to uh, just to be in Monte Carlo, to, to go to the casino, to, and, but then to also be at the casino with great philatelists, like not yeah. just with random people, yeah. but with people who I've seen exhibit or I've read their books or articles. That's a really fun component of it, that you're in one of the most amazing places on the face of the earth with like-minded people. Yeah. Um, it, it, again, for me at least, and, and it's also where I, I met you and Kaylee for the first time. Yeah. Um, obviously, I think we'd been copied on emails together because mm-hmm. we're both YPLF alums and whatnot, but we'd never met. And it took us going to um, a, a different continent to uh, actually be able to meet for the first time. So yeah. that was, um, the again, in terms of, uh, our own friendship, I think that was an important milestone as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the where we met Chris, or at least I met Chris Green for the first time, one of our former I, I, I was going to say, I think he, uh, probably where I met him for the first time as yeah. well. I've met so many people, The uh, uh, you know, where I got to know uh, George James, who we spoke to uh, mm-hmm. from Gibbons. And uh, like, there's, there's so many great young people that I've met from India, yeah. from Belgium, from the UK, from all these places, even, again, and then even people within our own country, like yourself, <laughs> yeah. who I met. Um, it, it's been such a, an honor and a, a thrill to be able to uh, attend that show. So we'll, without further ado, let's yeah. just bring Patrick on. because I, I don't know what, what further introduction he needs. He, um, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's such an entertaining and engaging uh, gentleman, and I think that we should stop talking about him and start talking to him. I completely agree. Here we go. Hi. Good to see you, Patrick. So is the is the view okay? Yes, perfect, perfect. perfect. Fine. Thank you so much for for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to to meet with us. You're welcome. Uh, so I just wanted to kick it off by uh, by thanking you for what you've been doing uh, w- with a young philatelist, inviting them to the Club de Monte Carlo every every year. But I was wondering if I could ask you a little bit about um, your your journey from your journey to become president of uh, the club de Monte Carlo. Okay. Um, it started, I think, uh, in 2000. Well, I, I had become a member already um, beginning of the, I, I, I think, 2006 or something. Um, and then uh, in 2008, um, there was a big change in the organization of the club. The um, secretary, until then, had been someone um, working for the uh, post office in Monaco. And uh, all of a sudden, he was promoted um, to another job, uh, a very uh, attractive one. He was um, 
promoted to be part of the team of the Monaco Embassy in Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. So um, that was a major problem for the club um, because they lost a very valuable uh, sec. And they also, and uh, his successor at the post was no longer uh, ready to, to do the job for the club. So they were looking for someone who wanted to be the on sec, which is, as you all know, the job, the most demanding job in an organization. And um, so um, uh, apparently uh, I was the only candidate and I actually had to push to be to be the candidate because they didn't believe uh, they didn't know me and they didn't believe I could do it. But um, in the end, uh, I had to go to the palace. I had to present myself. And um, uh, so I needed the blessing of, of the palace. Wow. And in the end, uh, I was accepted in 2008 as the um, on sec. So I was on the board. And um, 6 January or 7 January 2009, the president suddenly dies of the Club de Monte Carlo. So I had never attended a board meeting and uh, the first board meeting I had to attend was after the funeral where we were uh, in a room at the palace and where the secretary of the prince said, look, gentlemen, um, you are now here at the funeral. You will leave to all corners of the world after this uh, funeral. We need to solve the problem of the presidency here and now. And um, 2009 was the year of the terrible crisis in, um, in the banking uh, world. So um, the number one candidate was uh, the vice president, logically. But he couldn't do it because uh, he was involved in Swiss banking and had other uh, concerns at that time and couldn't do it. Second one um, they were thinking of was a certain Mr. Bianchi, Paolo Bianchi. Um, and um, all the others, all the other board members couldn't, uh, couldn't become president because they only spoke either French or English and you need to speak both to, to be the president in Monaco. So, um, and Paolo Bianchi said, look, um, I'm, um, in those days, he was about uh, above 65 anyway. And he said, uh, look, there is one young person here in the room. I was below 50 in those days. And uh, he said, uh, or we should elect Patrick for president, which was um, a big surprise to me, a big surprise to most of the others around the table. But in the end, uh, so by a tragic event, uh, the sudden death of our president and by coincidence, Paolo Bianchi knowing me. And why did he know me? Because we both collect Belgian Congo. So <laughs> that's uh, so uh, all these uh, a coincidence, a tragedy, everything together. I, I think the Club de Monte Carlo is, is interesting because, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's certainly a very exclusive club and a very, um, you know, it, it brings together the, the, the best collectors from around the globe, I would say. But on the other hand, the stamp show every two years is very welcoming and is one of the warmest and friendliest shows I've ever attended to collectors of all levels. The first time uh, I went back in 2015, I, I you know, in uh, relative terms, barely knew what a postage stamp was. <laughs> and yet all the club members and everyone organizing the show was was uh, they embraced me very warmly. Can you talk a little bit about what that's like to have all of these great collectors, yes. but to also create an atmosphere that is, again, welcoming to a, a complete beginner? Well, um, the the fact that we only have 100 members is because there are only 100 frames in the Postal Museum. And um, as Monaco is very small, there is no way to extend the number of frames. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have to buy a part of France. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and um, basically, the club was founded because Prince Renier, the father of Prince Albert, was a, a very um, was was a real philatelist. He was very interested in his stamp collection. He built that museum for his own collection, by the way. Um, 
he um, he wanted also a club based in Monaco, um, and his dream was to you to bring together the 100 most important collections in the world, and by collections, um, um, he meant both uh, institutional collections like the ones from the Smithsonian or um, the ones from other postal museums. And also, and of course, also of uh, private members. But this combination of institutional and private membership is quite unique, I think, um, for a club. Um, and when I um, attended Monaco Phil, uh, let's say in the early years 2000, the image was uh, the image was not so good. We had the image of having big collections, but being totally ignorant, rich people who didn't know um, on which side to glue a stamp uh, almost. Um, and um, they called us the Club Met of Philately. So um, I thought this was wrong because the people who were members were not only wealthy, some of them at least, but they were also very heavily involved and organized philately everywhere in the world. And it was unfair. Um, it was an unfair situation anyway. But um, I thought the fact that they are not taking us too seriously, but and they, the fact that they always uh, our enemies uh, to use a big word, always say it's it's only glamour and glitter. Then I thought, why not use this glamour and glitter for philately to promote it and just to take, yeah, to use it. And that's exactly what the principality also wanted. They know they they have a very glamorous um, image, and. Um, they 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 like it to be used to promote something that is uh, a purpose that is far better and which is uh, good for everyone so um the warm atmosphere is due to the extreme involvement let's say of the prince himself mm. which uh, which makes that uh, everyone wants to go especially uh, inhabitants of republics all over the world they love royal families and um, um, that makes a big difference that also makes the difference for the and and uh, for their um, partners because um, most of the partners of philatelists do not collect stamps and or mm. extremely bored at other stamp shows most of the time you see them all of them alone mostly men and a few women but never the husband or uh, the spouse is there. So um, in Monaco, it's different. Uh, uh, we also put a lot of effort in all these um, um, social events in order to make them very accessible for um, for non-philatelists. So that's um, that's uh, makes one difference. And also the show itself um, must be appealing to non-philatelists. And if you look at the teams we had, we had uh, the polar philately where we turned the whole thing into uh, an Antarctic landscape. Uh, we had you now the um, the Egyptian uh, party where the we turned the ex the Hotel de Paris into an Egyptian temple. So all this adds to the atmosphere, doesn't add anything to philately, but we never forget that the ultimate goal is to promote philately. And um, I think um, in the end, people have understood what the ultimate goal is and that our hobby has to be taken uh, seriously and is not uh, something for a few uh, strange uh, individuals. And I think there's no question as to the success of the implementation of this idea and the this, um, <clears throat> you know, the sort of guiding philosophy effort. is, yeah. is, is yeah. really important. I yeah. Think. So, so we have the glamour and the glitter, and we have the budget. And with that budget, how do we promote philately? Well, by organizing these uh, events, which are 
more than just a, a normal decoration, let's say, by inviting the young philatelists for free, by uh, all these kinds of efforts, and by publishing every for every uh, Monaco Phil edition, and this was already before my time, we want to publish a book which should be the reference in its field for the 10 years to come. And if you look at the books which we published, most of them have had large goals at international exhibitions. So um, that's also one books, publications, uh, the atmosphere for everyone attracting and then especially develop the the future of our hobby by including uh, young people. Mm. You talk a little bit more about that uh, philanthropic uh, uh, piece of the puzzle, because when I was invited to my first Monaco Phil in 2015, I was uh, stunned and, and speechless at the, the generosity of the club and at yourself. And, and little did I know that that trip would um, you know change my life when I met Dieter Michelson and, and Carl Louis and ended up yes. with, a, with a job. So, I, you know, I, I don't think anybody could have predicted that would or it's, you know certainly not myself. But, you know, again, that was one of the kindest gestures that's ever been extended to myself and i think i speak for michael as well can you talk about why that's so important to you because um I, again that's just really sort of un, unprecedented in in this hobby well the future of our hobby depends on uh, identifying the individuals individuals who are um still collecting and on a higher level so um um uh, we took the decision uh, one uh, I, I don't know, I don't remember when, but somewhere to 2015, I think, to um, use the budget to invite 30 people from all over the world, young people, but not any young philatelist. No, you were on a list that I got from Alex Hyman, which was um, apparently in the US, there is some, there are a few programs for young philatelists and you were on one of, both of you were on one of these lists. And um, so by asking everywhere, we came up with a small group of about 30 or maybe less, 20 people. Um, but uh, from US, India, France, Belgium, uh, everywhere, let's say. And this is important for the future of our hobby. If, if you only are invited to parties where there is a... a where there are only old people present, um, that's, I think it's also for, for everyone. For you, it's better to have uh, many young people around you who couldn't afford it if they had to pay it uh, themselves, or most of them couldn't. And uh, for the older people, it's also nice to have uh, the young people in the room. And uh, yeah, it's it works it works both ways. And it's also a kind of selfishness if young people don't collect anymore. To whom will we sell our collections when we die? Well, before we die, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> well, th th that's a good segue. I also wanted to ask you about your own specific collecting interests because you mentioned Belgian Congo. Yes. I believe that you have a, a, a U.S. collection as well, if I'm not mistaken. Of a I have a, yes, I have the I have a collection of the U.S. Huguenot uh, issue, 1924. Yeah, the Walloon Huguenot issue. Which I, I live in New Rochelle, which was uh, settled by the, the Huguenots way back okay. in the 1600. So I have a particular fondness of that issue. But so, in terms of your Belgian Congo collection, and your what is it that um, that you're looking for? What still gets you excited uh, these days? What what are your own uh, philatelic uh, uh, pursuits right now? Yeah, um, let's say um, for stamps of the Congo, I'm almost. Um, yeah, I have most of the rarities, and the excitement come. The excitement comes f uh, mostly from the postal history part of the collection. So there, it's that's endless, and it's never over. There will always discoveries of new covers, and uh, uh, th there's no new chapter. There are new chapters to write still. While uh, for the stamps, well, the stamps, uh, there has been so many studies and the, the chance of having any special stamp still showing up is very small. So the postal history part is really, really uh, interesting. So do you exhibit yourself uh, at on one of those 100 panes at the, at the club every two years? 
Yes, uh, every two years, um, all members are invited. And actually, this is one of the most important uh, reasons to become a member or to, 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 to stay a member is to exhibit uh, during the what we co used to call the World Rarities, but we have now changed the name to um, Iconic Items. Mm. And can you, do you mind talking a little bit about that, how one becomes a member? Since we only have 100 members, uh, we cannot uh, accept a new member unless right. someone uh, disappears. Um, but uh, in the light of the average age, this happens uh, every year, unfortunately. Um, and then um, we look for the best collector to fill the gap. Uh, it's always a matter of collections. So um, if you have a unique collection in your field, uh, you have to prove that you have uh, a few iconic items. And if you can prove us that you have at least three and your and um, yeah, then it's a matter of yeah, taste of the of the of the of the board members. Um, if three three collectors are on the same level, then we have to choose one one. Then it depends on what your your personal preference is, of course. Uh, but um, let's say that we have more candidates than than room. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds um, like a good problem to have. Yeah, but although there is nothing in it for the members, eh? so it's pure, right. it's pure philanthropy. Members don't get, almost get nothing for free. Eh? They mm -hmm. they just sponsor everything. One of the greatest thrills when I check my mail is receiving a postcard or a Christmas card from one of your various uh, travels around the globe. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, your your quest to? Uh, visit and and send mail and and, and I, I still remember uh, one of your keynote speeches that I heard where you detailed a, I remember Pit Karen in particular. Can you talk a little yes. bit about this uh, aspect of your life, where yeah. your your quest to uh, conquer the globe? Um, this, first of all, um, Christmas cards are one thing, and uh, the cards from traveling are another. So that's two <laughs> distinct uh, points. Um, but m traveling is my other hobby. So uh, besides uh, philately, uh, I love to travel. Um, and um, even the pandemic uh, didn't stop me from uh, traveling. But then, of course, I had to choose the places where I could go, mm. which were uh, islands where no one lived. So <laughs> like uh, St. Kilda, which is from a philatelic point of view, an interesting destination, and Rockall, which is uh, a rock claimed by four nations. And uh, with Brexit now, yesterday, or uh, yes, two days ago in the press, uh, the, there was uh, uh, a UK warship um, entered a, um, a fishing vessel of Ireland at Rockall. So uh, we were almost writing history this summer. <laughs> um, so it, it's, yeah, that's a passion. Why do I like to travel? Uh, it's genetic. My great grandfather um, before 1900 already traveled uh, to Nicaragua, to uh, St. Louis, uh, to the Niagara Falls, to Sweden. He went for a weekend to London, and I'm talking before uh, 1900. So um, my parents um, took us around the globe as well. I had been to all continents before I was 20. Uh, and um, but even long before, I think I was only 12 or 13, wow. um, except Antarctica. Uh, it's family related, and uh, in my family, uh, if you don't travel, they ask, they, they think you're very sick. <laughs> <laughs> Is there, uh, I, I imagine the list of places that you have not been that you'd like to go to is, is um, very small compared to most people are there one or two places that are at the top of your list that uh that, that you know you still want to to check off in the coming years yeah the two top ones uh, are actually planned for this year so later this month i normally go to clipperton 
it doesn't ring a bell eh? or does it um no, Tipperton no. is a tiny little island uh in the pacific ocean which belongs to france by coincidence but um it's too s- a few uh, times they tried to found a settlement on the island but uh, the, the last one almost died because they forgot to send ships for provisions <laughs> so um it's really if you if you will look at it on the map um you will see that it's um one of the most isolated places uh, in the world and um but that's how the french are they love it to have to own islands like that which costs them a lot of money and but doesn't bring any anything to them <laughs> as, as except the national prestige um so that's uh, one of the two and the second one um that this one is planned for end of december is the island of tristan da cunha in the mid atlantic uh, mid south atlantic and both are very difficult to get to because there is no almost no regular um traffic to them clipperton none and to tristan da cunha only uh, a mail boat uh, from mm. Cape Town, but then you are uh, away for three weeks if you take that mail boat, and I, I don't have that time, so um, <laughs> I chartered together with uh, a few friends um, a motor yacht, and we will go to Tristan from from Cape Town too. Wow, that's um, really exciting stuff that. Uh, incredible that i'd never heard of that island before but um so so you've been president of the club de monte carlo since 2009 you said 12 12 yes. years other yes. than what we what we've already talked about what would you say one of your largest challenges as president has been challenges yeah oh. um well the, the the challenge was to be taken seriously um we were philatelically we were not taken seriously and no we are so that was the biggest challenge um yeah that was the biggest for the rest it was all pretty um well, a lot of work of course but right. uh, no real difficult challenges is there a uh, you know is there a particular moment at one of the exhibitions or uh, you know again the, the three that I've attended every moment has been spectacular but is there one event or one dinner or one moment that sticks out to you as a particularly meaningful uh, you know milestone in in your tenure with the the club? A milestone, that's a big word, huh? big word. Um, uh, no, I wouldn't um, say that one was better than the other. I, I have no. I haven't thought of milestones anyway. <laughs> kind of a slow, slow progression. Yeah, steady yeah. uphill. Yeah, I've, they were all quite similar. Um, yeah, no. No milestones, unfortunately. So what are your, you know, you talked about the largest challenge being taken seriously. You you've yes. weren't before, are now. What what uh, is would be next on your radar for, it, it, do you set goals for the club? Or what, what are you looking to accomplish in the next few, the next five uh, yep. events, would you say? My succession. Um, I'm... Um, after doing it for 12 years, um, I think it's time to look for a new face and a new person um, to um, to do the job. And that's, um, for me, the biggest uh, challenge. And um, I would say trying to still um, to still improve what we are doing and maybe and that's something i was also thinking about why not um, 
make Monaco Phil an FIP international show every two or three years then, or then we don't have to do it every two years. So these are the dreams, uh, a transition and um, turn Monaco Phil into uh, an FIP show. This is probably a difficult question, but are, are there any uh, updates on, on the coming Monaco Phil, given the state of the world? Is the uh, I, normally, I know, normally it will be organized um, uh, from 7 to 9 December. And um, we started um, the preparation, but we haven't made publicity yet because we only want to put ads in magazines and so when we are absolutely certain that COVID will not uh, prevent us from organizing it. Yeah, sounds like the absolute safest way to go about that, yeah. But for the rest, the dates are fixed and um, the hotel rooms are um, reserved temporarily. Thank yeah. you for your generosity, your support of the youth. And, and when you talk about young people enjoying seeing other young people at shows, I can vouch for that because so many of these these great young people from belgium from india from the united kingdom uh are, are still people i stay in touch with i've seen them at other shows and this community that you've uh created of, of serious philatelists from around the globe um you know under a certain age has been really wonderful and has helped me stay passionate and has helped me stay involved and i i, I think that's um you know really really key you know as great as it is to meet the club members and um again i i enjoy spending time with any collector um, but to know there's other like-minded people out there um, similar in age to myself and Michael, that's um, that's been really special. And I think the fact that you've created that community is um, a, a real testament to your time with, with the club and, and just your time in Philately in general. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, uh, I hope that it will, of course, uh, be continued in the future. So that's also one of the things that my that I would like to have continued is um, this initiative to involve as many young people as possible. Yeah, and I think it's such an important task. As, as Charles has proof himself and, and myself, it's it's a life-changing uh, thing you've, you've done here in involving the in youth in the club and and the connections that they make. It's, it's, um, it's definitely a hobby-promoting, hobby... Promoting, hobby uh, hobby enduring yeah well it's yeah and uh, in fact uh, i repeat what i already said but it's also a matter of uh, the survival of our hobby mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah of course to to have new collectors there's young people but we also have a serious um a number of people from around 40 45 who joined the the, the hobby um, who have been collecting when they were young and then put their collections on ice uh, while they were organizing their career and uh, their families and then at a certain age come back. So that's that's also important. But um, in the end, they all had collected when they were very young and if you don't have this basis, um, then the... Um, then we will also miss the 45 the 45 year old in 20 years from now eh? yeah the foundation has to be there for some the foundation them to come has back. to be there yeah, yeah. And, and just one, one last question patrick if you don't mind do you have a piece of advice that you wish you had heard when you were starting out collecting or that you'd like to give to young people or 45 year olds is there one bit of advice about philately that that you think is important to uh impart on people well the most important advice I got, but it is, it, it's not only for philately, but when I went to the palace um, as uh, the potential new um, on secretary, the president in those days was an extremely wise man, Jean Fissor. He told me, never go to the palace with problems, always go to the palace with solutions. And I have applied this rule throughout my life and my career. Whenever there is a problem, first look for a solution and then go and uh, and talk to the people involved. And But at least you put the solution on the table. And that was a very wise advice and I, I will never forget it. <clears throat> yeah, that's wonderful. Terrific advice. Yep. Thank you so much, Patrick, for taking the time out and every for everything you do for the hobby and, and the club and, and 
absolutely everything. You're very welcome. And um, thank you very much for inviting me for this um, Zoom session, absolutely. Which, is, which, which is a good initiative. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I, w w without your uh, stewardship of, of the two of us, uh, an idea like this never would have even come to Michael no. and myself. So you, uh, again, we, we, we can't thank you enough for, for no, what you've don't done. No, you shouldn't exaggerate either. Eh? So, uh, <laughs> no, I, first, have, I first met. You would have made your way uh, without me. Eh? <laughs> well, we, we, the, the, the first time we ever met in person was Monaco Phil 2017. Yeah. Was, uh, was it 17? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. But, I, I went in 15 the first time, Michael went in 17. And uh, again, even though we yeah. are both Americans, it took us going to... <laughs> Monaco to even meet face to face. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. um, that's uh, because um, yeah, you can't. Uh, when you're young, you can't. You don't have the time. And you don't have the, the the financial ability to go to stamp shows where where all the others gather all the time. Eh? Yeah. So um, you probably make your choice of one or two shows, and then if someone else chooses other shows, then you don't meet. <clears throat> Thank you so much for, You're for welcome. absolutely everything. And, and safe, safe travels uh, later yes. this month. Thank absolutely. you very much. Um, well, let's hope that uh, I will be allowed to leave the country <laughs> because they are talking now to close the borders again. <clears throat> so that would be... Fingers oh, no. crossed uh, for, yeah. your, for yeah, your but safe passage. To keep me in the country, they will have to, to be very... The law has to be very strong. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, Thank great you talking so much. to you. See you. Bye bye. Thank you bye. very much, too. Thank you, Michael. That was that was really fun. Um, I, somebody like Patrick, who is so involved in so and and Philately is you know again, he's got uh, you know plenty of other uh, uh, business interests and and things outside of Philately. For him to take yeah. time out of his schedule to talk to us is um is really humbling too. Yeah, this, he's an incre the, incredibly the club busy is like this. In yeah, I know. Grand I know. Of it, so. Um, again, the fact that he he uh, spoke to us um, is is second only to his inviting me to Monaco and inviting you to Monaco in the mm -hmm. first place in terms yeah. of um, my it, my uh, humility. What I think about too when I talk to him because he's very funny. Yeah, yeah, he is. And he's saying this in his second language. <laughs> Most people can't tell a good joke in their first language. Yeah, yeah. And I think that whenever I see him speak, he's so funny. Yeah, yeah, and he's doing this in a foreign tongue. It's incredible. Yeah. It is. Think and I about think how funny a... he is in French. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that that they that that the president of the club has to be able to speak English and French. It can't. They they want to include absolutely all the members. That, that it can't be I one was... or the other. His generosity really knows no bounds, in the in the fact that he's he's looking to. When he talked about one of the largest things that he was looking for in a successor is the fact that they'd keep the youth program going. It is really, you know, it's lo he's looking for the program to to extend past himself and really promote the entire hobby um, outside I, of him, you know, his own uh, aspirations. Absolutely, and I think his point about identifying sort of high potential, serious young collectors yeah. is important as well. It's some. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not casting a wide net and seeing what comes of it. It's it's figuring out who are these twenty or thirty people from around the globe who exhibit interest and you know are, are investing money in, and how can we invest money in them to make sure that we keep them. And I, I, I think that piece of it is is very important as well to identify those high potential uh, young people. I appreciate it, and yeah. uh, and I think anyone who has been um, uh, a beneficiary of, of Patrick and the club's generosity would would say the same thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't want to. I'm not going to speak for Patrick in any sense. But the success well, of the program. He did that for thirty minutes. I know. <laughs> the success of the program we don't need is you almost, to speak for him. Um, you know, proof in the fact that you are or I am where we are because of because of his show. Because he wanted to achieve something and keep the hobby going with by investing time and money and, and bringing in a potential Absolutely. youth into the into the more professional world and it, and it, and it has succeeded and I, I definitely think he he sees that other people see that they see that in the sense that that he said he felt like the club wasn't taken seriously before but now everybody knows it is 
it, the fact that he can accomplish that in just 12 years as as president of the club is just it's incredible yeah it's incredible well this was a great chat this was a nice uh again we've been looking forward to this one and i love you know these last couple of weeks in particular have lived up to our pre-show expectations i would say yeah, uh yeah. it's been a, a fun couple of a uh, couple of weeks for us so um I, I really enjoyed this. Do you want to mention who we've got next week? So next week, we're actually talking to Matthew Hall of Stamp Collector Magazine. He, Which is a big British publication. This is a, a, yeah. a major uh, philatelic uh, uh, periodical of the, the British stamp scene. Yeah, he's done interviews of, of philatelists before. I, I, I saw a video that he interview he did with Gordon Eubanks. I saw he actually uh, interviewed Patrick on a... Uh, questionnaire that he published in the magazine it, it seems like so, there might be some way for his magazine and our podcast to work together potentially in the future potentially in the future yeah <laughs> in <ten. laughs> uh, um, no that's gonna be that's gonna be a really fun one uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that yeah i'm looking forward to him because he he self-described not as a philatelist himself but he's so involved in philately and reporting on it so he's he's really focusing on the people in philately and the events going on but but said he would not call himself a philatelist so it's another one of those guests where they don't consider themselves a philatelist we're talking to them but they're so involved in the hobby i feel like we're splitting the difference very well balancing you know yeah. pure philatelists with philately uh, adjacent uh, personalities <laughs> philately uh, adjacent I like that <laughs> but I, I I think it's great though that we're yeah. we're showing how diverse uh, and and wide ranging the hobby is. It's not mm -hmm. just people who sit there hinging stamps into spots in the album. It's it, there's so many different avenues to to take this. Yeah, there's a there's a definite. When I first started out in the hobby, I had a definition of philatelists in my head, and I feel like we've shattered that. It's taken, so. it's taken this I long. So. Nobody knows what philately means anymore. I don't know uh, what it means anymore. <laughs> We've talked to so many different <laughs> people that... It, it, yeah, it's exactly what we should be trying to do is erode the very definition <laughs> of the hobby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it, it, there was something else you wanted to mention before we uh, wrap things up here, I believe. Yeah, so there was... Um, Allegedly, this is something that other podcasts do. Right. I listened to a and couple it, of other... That's podcasting. a lie. You listen to dozens of other podcasts. This is your life. Um, I listen yeah. to like two podcasts. Mm -hmm. Can I can I give a podcast a shout out? Absolutely. In case they hear it, and then yeah. like maybe they'll I'll, I'll like I'll send it. But there's a podcast called Tetrapod Zoology. Okay. Which is uh, run? Uh, it's hosted by a gentleman named Darren Nash uh, from the UK, and um, uh, John Con uh, John Conway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is his co-host, and they talk about uh, tetrapods, which are... So I, I was a, a, a geology major. Paleontology was my first love before philately. And uh, they talk about tetrapods, which are four-limbed creatures. So we're talking amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's it sounds like it shouldn't be that interesting, um, but it's fantastic. And even if you're not as invested in paleontology and biology as I am, um, tetrapod zoology is the most entertaining podcast I've ever found. So I'm going to give them a shout out, which is also something I think that podcasts do. They and, do. They do. And then maybe they'll give us a shout out. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, in light the... of that, I'd like to also mention uh, Malcolm yes. Gladwell's podcast, Revisionist History. You know Malcolm really, Gladwell? You, uh, I was you think you're really punching up trying to get us a shout out from <laughs> uh, Jim. You're going, you're going for the big time. I love, I love the guy. Uh, read yeah. all of his books at least five times. Um, but his, the, his podcast on looking at historical events – from the opposite side of the, you know, the opposite side of history, really, is it's it's really interesting when it really questions or makes you think about events that you thought you, you, you thought you understood and you really just didn't. And um, what is, um, what is this podcast called? Revisionist History. Revisionist History. So we listen to Tetrapod Zoology yeah. and Revisionist History. Yeah. And then hopefully some of their listeners will uh, come listen to conversations with philatelists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is something we got a little off track. This is something that other podcasts do is they, they read out listener mail. So I before I read this, I want to let you guys know that I double check with all the people who sent us mail 
in that I can read their mail that they're sending in on the podcast. And this um, is not just stuff that I send to Michael from burner email accounts either. <laughs> we think right. these are real people. Um, so we think, yeah. Uh, this is from, uh, I'll, I'm going to still keep it anonymous though. J N from, uh, from Nova Scotia in Canada. He said, uh, he actually sent this quite some time ago. Happy Christmas Eve. Just wanted to send a note to say that I've been enjoying your podcasts. I'm a new ish collector having pulled my father's old album out of the closet. That's been sitting there for 25 years. I collected a little as a kid, but as of many of us did and pulling his album out, I've reinvig it's reinvigorated me in the hobby. Uh, there's much to learn. And at times, overwhelming. I've joined the Royal Philatelic Society and the American Philatelic Society, as well as our local small and aging club. I love, I would love to hear your insight into how to broach the topic of bringing a small local club into the 21st century. Members are wonderful and very supportive of a neophyte such as myself, but it reminds me a little of church, good folks that are resistant to change. I think this I think would that would be a good basis for an episode. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll let you finish. That would be a good basis for an episode. I think. Yeah, it. it I thought we could. I, I emailed him back with the. I don't mean to interrupt him, but I emailed him back with a response that I thought we could kind of just discuss a little bit. I think this would make a great topic in the near future. If you can provide any quick advice via email, I'd love to hear it. At fifty, I'm easily the youngest member and at least knowledgeable. The books are still done on an old ledger. And the minutes are handwritten, although one member now at least types them up after. Uh, they're resistant to social media and really any use of com computers. Keep up the great work, JN. So my biggest takeaway from this note that I love, I don't want to cut you off, but yeah. what I love is here's a guy collected a bit as a kid, has his father's collection, and his first, his first question after looking at his father's collection is not, how much money can I sell this for? <laughs> right. It's not, and I get yeah, it. We got a lot, lot of those. people. Who, we got a lot of said, a lot of people don't have the collecting bug. That's fine, and they just want to monetize what they inherit. Mm -hmm. I get that. I'm not begrudging that at all. But it is so refreshing to have somebody who takes this collection and says, "I'm going to go join these societies. I'm going to listen to podcasts. I'm going to reach out to other collectors." I love that 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 is the way he took it because that could have gone multiple different ways, and so often goes in an entirely different direction. The fact that he said, "I'm going to learn now." Um, my hair is getting crazier as the episode goes on. <laughs> um, the fact that he took it upon himself to uh, engage and to involve himself. You know, there's so many people who collect who never will join a society. The fact that he rattles off the three that he's joined, I think that's fantastic. That yeah. gives me a lot of hope. And well, here's what Patrick was talking about. Let's tie it back into the interview. Yeah. He collected as a young person. He's 50, and he's just getting back into it yeah. and, and has many, many – uh, fruitful decades of collecting ahead of him. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's not just about getting young people involved. Here's a young person in relative terms for the hobby yeah. who is, um, that seed was planted and now it's sprouting. Now it's gestating. Right, exactly. And, and, and it's not only he's looking for it in his, in his own interest, his own collecting bug and, and everything like that, but he's looking to reach out to people and see how he can improve the club's that already exist and help improve the membership of the clubs around him so that he can keep collecting. It, so many people approach philately from a different perspective. You know, it can be a, a solitary hobby, but it can right. also be such a social hobby. And the fact that he's coming into it now at 50 years old and looking to continue it as a social hobby because he, he sees it as, as something that brings people together and he wants to continue that. It's, uh... And I think it sparks an interesting question as well, because I feel like so many times to bring a club into the 21st century, the knee jerk response is like, get a Facebook page. Right. And then there's like five or six posts on Facebook. And then the page languishes for years. Mm -hmm. And it tops out at like 17 likes. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I, I'm not being dismissed. There are no, I know. very well run social media pages. But I, I do think that, you know, it's not as easy as like get the club a Twitter account. Yeah. And you're saved. You're in the 21st century. I think it is a very nuanced issue. You know, there's there's a, a, a society I belong to that doesn't have any website or, or social media presence or anything, mm -hmm. yet has still utilized Zoom in, in a very good way to, yeah. um, you know, continue to be 
active over the last year. So I, I think it is a nuanced question that um, that I'm going to sort of uh, mull over and, and mm-hmm. think about, and, and and maybe we can come up with some some recommendations by next week. But yeah. again, it's it's not as easy as just uh, you know, get a Facebook page. Yeah. Well, with my my first knee jerk reaction to him almost was I've seen some clubs not super locally but but grand locally New England area become successful by almost fundraising and within their own club and then taking out ads on Facebook on Google but not sure. for their own Facebook page just to advertise the fact that the club exists right people people search for it they search for stamps and and Google does this really um crazy creepy thing where it knows your location and if you're searching for stamps and there's a club 10 miles away someone's advertising for a club 10 miles away pops up with an advertisement hey there's this if you club. watch this video you'll probably get targeted ads yes and we we really apologize for that <laughs> so I, I i think jay raises some great points and i uh again i'm just i'm thankful to have somebody who um, again, this is the, the sort of apocryphal story that you you hear a lot and you mm-hmm. want to be true more often that somebody collects, doesn't collect, inherits a collection or retires or a kid graduates college and then comes back to it. Um, and again, somebody who inherits a collection who doesn't just say, what's it worth, <laughs> is, is refreshing right. to me. That, yeah. That's really, really great to hear. Um, yeah, so we can we can definitely think about this a little more, Absolutely. but I think uh, yeah, it's an important question to be to to ask, and we've definitely spoken to like Graham Beck, who and, said and you I, can't just create a Facebook page. No, and so much of this hobby is rooted in the past. It is yeah. it is a very tangible. I mean, again, we collect letters and envelopes and stamps. We collect things that are by their very nature outdated. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, again, the the mail I receive is is often contrived i don't get legitimate letters with stamps on them you know what i mean it's it's my friend sending me stuff so so we do need to keep ourselves rooted in the past it's not as Mm -hmm. easy as just social media platforms and zoom and this and that we you know i I think there's a middle ground between existing on facebook and handwriting uh you know meeting notes (laughs) (laughs) exactly yeah yeah and and it, it might be as uh you know the members that they're trying to get could still read print media you know i've Absolutely. seen ads in newspapers for the for the concord uh stamp club in the classifieds or so michael this was a lot of fun yeah um let's uh i can tell do it again soon but we have to we committed to a weekly <laughs> podcast um this is on google podcast spotify podcast apple podcast uh subscribe to us or go to our website philatelypodcast.com or yeah. now that people know that we're um uh, reading emails aloud, they will, will either see a big uptick in emails <laughs> or a just plummet in the number of emails. <laughs> we no one, no yeah. one, no, fear nobody that wants we'll to expose be them. outed like that. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, flatlypodcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. We're both on Twitter. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll, put those, well, we'll put those links we'll in. Put there. All, exactly. But I do, I do want to say that I'm, I'm not going to read anyone's emails that I have not checked first. Right, <laughs> I've definitely not, emailed. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Definitely exactly. email no, we, these we guys. We run it by them, and yeah. yeah. So, and if you're writing us and, and you'd like us to read it, you can even preemptively put that yeah. in the email, I suppose. Yeah, you could do that. So, absolutely. So, we, we like that kind of feedback. Uh, you know, tweet at us, email us, um, YouTube. Co- well, I love YouTube comments. Yeah, I have. I haven't gotten back most to most of them. <laughs> yes, Michael. This was great. This was a lot of fun, as always, and uh, we'll we'll talk again real soon. Absolutely. All right. See you next week. Talk to you later, man. All right. Thanks.